Hey everybody, welcome to All Team Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, and in this video, I'm gonna run over some strategies that you can use to reduce your PCB production costs, specifically during fabrication. Now, in a previous video, we looked at how to design an IC carrier that this IC carrier was something that I needed for a prototype, and we did end up producing the board and getting it assembled on the prototype successfully. So what I'm going to do in this video is show you some of the strategies that I use to reduce the cost of that board, and we're going to implement those same strategies into one of our other projects, which is our USB to UART bridge controller project. That project is something I still haven't produced yet, but I do want to produce it, but before we send it off for production, I'm going to take some steps to reduce the fab cost and get it as low as possible so that way I can order multiples of these and then do some testing. Make sure to hop into All Team Designer and follow along. Let's get started. So in our previous project, we were developing an IC carrier board that was going to hold a particular component, and that component required a footprint which mismatched the actual footprint that was on the prototype circuit board. So there's a link in the description. You can check out that other video on developing an IC carrier board. Now, when we were originally doing that video, you can see here on screen that this is what that carrier board ended up looking like. Now I have all team designer open and you can see that this is what the carrier board actually looked like when we went and sent it in for manufacturing. So we made some changes to the board after the video was already completed in order to reduce some of the costs and to provide a faster lead time. Some of the changes were also done for signal integrity. So this brings up the point of the video. The point of the video here is to outline some of the things that we did to reduce the cost of the board and then get that fabrication cost down to a point where we didn't blow through any kind of budget for this and we were able to fix this board up for assembly without having to scrap our fabricated boards. Now this is really important because the boards that we had already fabricated they were pretty expensive. They were complex boards, they're eight layers, pretty dense components on them. With that being so expensive and being done at such short lead time, we didn't want to scrap those and then have to spend that money all over again just to fabricate new boards when all we have is a single mismatched footprint. So this was the board that we ended up sending into production. To see what we can do to take a board like we had originally and then make some slight modifications to it to then get the cost to come down quite a bit. What I wanna do is now take a look at a manufacturer's website. You can get an idea of what you need to do to reduce the cost for fabricating a board like this from a manufacturer's website. Now I'm on Sunstone Circuit's website and I would just like to point out that me being on Sunstone Circuit's website is not an official endorsement by myself or Altium of Sunstone Circuits, but I will say that they do have a very nice quote form that you can use to get to an order of magnitude basis some idea of how some changes in your design will broadly affect costs. So the numbers that you see here are not going to be the same numbers that you see from any other fabricator, but like I said, it gives you an idea of what types of changes you can expect to see in cost as you change certain elements of your design. So just as an example, in this particular instance, we fabricated three boards of this uh, carrier substrate because we had three prototypes that we wanted to fix up. For this particular example, our board measures 400 mils by 480 mils. So here we can just put in 0.4 divided by 0.48, and then we have two copper layers. So you can already get a sense for what the costs are gonna be just based on lead time, just looking at this table. Here, we wanted to go with, of course, the fastest lead time when we ended up doing this so that we can get this through assembly and get done with the project and, and move on to testing. Now, here's where you start to see the rub in terms of how you can approach the cost aspect of your production run. So the first case is, of course, tray size and spacing. So if your tray size and spacing is generally larger, like say you go all the way up to over 14 mils, you can probably bring down costs quite a bit. Whereas if you're down to, let's say, three mils, they won't even give you a number here on the website. They're actually going to require a custom quote. 
Same thing with four mils. If we bring this down to let's say five mils, here you can see a huge difference. Just going from six to nine mils from five mils, we have a difference in about seven X the cost. And that's for a one mil difference in your trace width, one mil. That's such a small amount, but it's such a huge change in the cost. So for us, when we look at this particular board and we go to the back layer and change the selection filter over to tracks, you can see here that we were using pretty wide traces up to 15 mils on some of these. Some of these other ones were 10 mils. And I think the smallest width here is indeed 10 mils. So in this case, if we go back over to the quote form, you can see here, I can throw this down to 10 to 14 mils, and it's gonna be the same as the six to nine mil option here on this material. The other thing is, of course, changing the material is also going to change the price of this board. So if I go over here to, let's say, you know, 170 TG, high TG board, that's another huge change in the board cost compared to just a standard 150 degree TG board. Here again, we went with the lower value because this is not going to be something that's gonna go into a production board and then get tested environmentally. This was just for functional testing to ensure that the prototype worked and of course to develop the embedded application. So there's no need for us to go all the way up to you know FR4 170TG. The production board does use Rogers, but if we were to go with Rogers 3000 series on this prototype, I think that's also a little overkill as well, primarily because this component is not an RF component. So if I just select the component here that's going to appear on the top layer, the component is actually a PLL123. So if we just select this, it's PLL123. This is a moderate speed digital component. The fastest edge rate here is gonna be about 2.4 nanoseconds at low bus capacitance. The rise times just go up from there. And on the board that we're soldering this to, it actually has series resistors to slow down the signal speed. The speed of these signals is actually gonna be a bit lower and that's okay for us. Again, this is just a clock buffer. It's not the fastest speed. It's reasonably fast speed, but we've implemented other high speed design guidelines here in this carrier board, which I'll go over momentarily. So we don't need something like Rogers or anything like that in this board. We can just, again, stick with the, the uh, less expensive component. Now the finish also has a major impact on the cost because if you're gonna go with something like silver or enig or hard gold, then of course you're going to increase the cost of your board. So let's just say we went with hard gold as our finish. They won't even quote it for you online. They're gonna require a custom quote. Let's say we did enig. That's an even bigger change than the other two options. The other two options were a 7X change in the cost. This is a, almost a 10X change in the cost, just going from tin lead all the way up to enig. That's a huge change. Let's say we only went with silver, something that I actually like to use on RF boards. Now silver is a smaller change, and in fact it actually costs about a dollar less than tin lead. One of the things about silver is that, um, of course, silver will tarnish, and Silver does have its uses in RF boards, and I actually did use silver in the RF board that this carrier will get then solder onto. Again, we don't really need it for this board. We're fine just using tin lead as our finish. Now, the next piece here is the smallest drilled hole. So the smallest drilled hole is very important because this can also impact the costs. If you remember on the original board, generally I'll go with something like, you know, a 10 mil hole here and then 18 mil pad. So that satisfies class two products. Here with a 10 mil drilled hole, you can see, again, we have about a seven X increase in the cost. So this goes all the way up to $296 for a 10 mil drilled hole. If we just change that to 14 mils, we've got a significant decrease in the cost. So these are all things that you can change or modify in a board in order to get those costs down significantly. And in fact, in the board that we ended up fabricating for this, if I just select these vias, you can see right here, we went with 14 mil hole size, 22 mil pad size on these vias. So that's plenty large for the product to still satisfy class two requirements, but it also reduces the cost of this board pretty significantly. So those are some of the options that you can take in this type of board in order to reduce the costs. So what we just saw in some of these examples was, of course, some pretty large changes in the cost for a small number of boards. 
as you scale up your volume to higher numbers, those costs can amortize pretty quickly. And so instead of seeing something on the order of, you know, a $200 increase in the fabrication run cost for a set of three boards, this could boil down to, you know, a dollar or a fraction of a dollar per board as you start to scale to higher and higher volume. This reminds me of a little quote from Greg Papandrew, who's actually one of our previous podcast guests. Take a look at what he had to say on this issue of cost optimization. I mean, I had a customer just recently uh, developed a project with him um, uh, almost three years ago and it came to fruition. It's a high runner, monthly runner, um, and it's a, practically a wearable. And they had it a four layer board and they said, Greg, we need to be a four layer board. We want to mill down. It needs to be 12.8 mils. It needs to be really thin. And, you know, they're going about it the wrong way. Also, we it, it's got to be uh, we have to use this material And I actually looked at him and said, you know, you really pigeonholed yourself in. Why can't we build this as a two layer? Uh, Why does it have to be black FR4? How about black solder mask? Um, Why this material when it doesn't go through an assembly process, you pick the most expensive material to build this board on where 150 TG works well. And they just kind of looked at me. And when it came right down to it, when I actually broached the subject on it, it's a million pieces a year. I was saving them 40 cents per board on this. And they said, Greg, why are you pushing so much? I said, well, I'll stop, but I'm giving you 400,000 reasons a year why you should redesign this board. <laughs> you know, And so that's where I really help when I look at stuff. Hey, do we have to have this kind of technology? Is that a question? And in some cases, yes, we do. So the moral of the story is this. Some of these small cost savings will really start to add up as you take a product and scale it up to high volume. Even if you're working with a manufacturer, you as the designer can take some initiative and implement some of these types of changes in the board ahead of going into production so that you can reduce the cost for your end customer. If you're like me and one of your clients is a manufacturer or an EMS service, what they're going to do is they're going to take that board and they're going to do some of that rework on it anyways to try and optimize cost. I think it's actually important for you as a designer to know some of those simple steps that you can take to reduce that cost for the end customer. Now, are you going to be able to do this on every board that you work on? Probably not. There are some things that you will be able to implement without affecting the operation of the board, and there are some things that you might not be able to implement. What we're going to do now is we're going to take a look at the other project that we just did recently, which was our USB to UART interface converter. Let's take a look at that board and see what we can do to modify that board so that we can optimize the costs a little bit and make sure that we can produce this for a reasonable amount at a reasonable volume. So now let's look at which of these strategies we can implement in this example. So in this example, I have my USB to UART converter pulled up, and there are some simple things that we can do to really bring down that cost when we want to produce this. So first and foremost is, of course, all of these vias. So these vias, if you just select them, you'll see that they all have a hole size of 10 mil and then a pad diameter of 18 mil. So this should be the most obvious one. Now, typically, if you have multiple via sizes, you'll need to select them all in groups. You can do that with a query or you can do that with the PCB list panel because they're all the same size. What I can do is just control A, select them all, and then I can go ahead and change the pad diameter and I can change the hole diameter. You'll notice here in this footprint, we have some vias that cannot be changed just by selecting them. That's because they are part of a footprint. So in order to implement that same strategy here in this part of the board, you would actually need to change this footprint. So you would need to go into your library and change this. So I'm not going to do it here in this demo, but just keep that as a note that you would want to change this. Then, of course, we need to go through and fix any of the design rule errors because once we make that change for these vias, we then need to do just some slight adjustments in order to ensure that we continue to satisfy all of the clearance rules in the PCB. And this can just be as simple as just grabbing a few of those vias and just moving them. Now, you have to be careful with this via stitching because when you select one of those vias in the via stitching, you'll notice it picks up the entire array. So I'm not going to do that regeneration. But here what I can do is I can just select this specific via. I could just delete it. Here you have to be careful 
because here in this example, after deleting this one that violates clearances, you'll see here that this one falls right onto a pad. So that's important because if we look in 3D, we can see that this via is partially tented, and then the opening here falls right into this pad. So once this capacitor goes to get soldered into this pad, there's the possibility that some solder is gonna fall right into that hole. So for this one, we would wanna delete it, and then what we could do is just grab the via tool, place it here, you see it's automatically gonna to connect to ground, and then we can just change the pad diameter and the hole size. So that's that via. And then we have one more over here that we need to select and we can just delete this. Again, it's getting too close to that data line. You could also try and just very gently move this over so it sits right in between all of those pads. And then we have one more right here. Again, just a slight movement up and then it's good to go. So that's all of our clearance errors. I think the next thing that we would wanna look at is the traces and trace spacing. So you'll notice here that if I just turn off the snapping options, and then just do the measure tool real quick, you can see what the clearance is here. Here you can see it's eight mils, so that's just fine. But here, if you look in this particular part of the board, and we do the measure tool, you'll actually see that it's much smaller. It's actually six mils. It's actually just under six mils if you zoom in. So you can see it's just six mils right here at this distance and the spacing between these is just under six mils. So you may want to adjust the spacing between these traces as well in order to widen them a little bit and then that will make sure you don't violate any sort of lower limit on a cost tier with your fabrication house. Those are the two things that we would want to look at in this particular board in order to reduce cost. There are some other simple things you can do, like of course grouping uh, components by part number once you start ordering at, at large quantity. If you're ordering a single group of components, you can get volume discounts. Looking through a BOM and finding parts that may have too high precision or small tolerances. If you don't need a 1% resistor, just go with a 10% resistor or a 5% resistor. Your board's probably still going to just work just fine. So a Little strategies like that can really help you reduce cost when you're preparing your board for production. I think the main thing that this illustrates is that it's very important to contact your fabrication house before you put the board in for production. If you just go and contact your fabrication house first as far as their cost structure and how they're gonna cost out the board based on some of the features in the PCB layout, you're gonna be able to identify some of those strategies that you can use to reduce costs early. Make sure you do that on the front end before you get too deep into a really complex board and then you run up the cost way too high and then blow through your budget. All right, that's all I have for today, folks. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure to hit that subscribe button and hit that like button. Of course, leave your comments and questions in the comment section. And if you have any great stories about costing out PCBs, including your horror stories, make sure to leave those in the comment section as well. Thanks again, everybody. And last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks. Yeah.